I now can sing since I've been redeemed. I'm on the everlasting, the everlasting rock. I faith in Christ, my Redeemer King. I'm on the everlasting, the everlasting rock. This is the voice of hope. Then roll, roll, billows roll. I'm on the everlasting rock of ages. Roll, roll, billows roll. I'm on the everlasting rock. Oh, for a heart to praise my God, a heart from sin set free, a heart that's free. Welcome to The Voice of Hope, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Anthony High, and I'm here with our Bible teacher, J. Mark Horst. The Voice of Hope is an expository Bible teaching program produced by Heralds of Hope. We're an international gospel ministry using media to make disciples of Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus told us to take the good news of salvation to every nation, tribe, and people group. However, It's not always comfortable interacting with people who are not like me. It can be hard to understand their language and culture, and it can feel dangerous. Sometimes it isn't safe, yet Jesus commands his followers to go. There are other times when those different people look a lot like me and even speak my language, but we may have some sort of disagreement with them. I fear these people may be more difficult to go to than those who are halfway around the world. A listener in Ethiopia feels this way too. Ethiopia has been experiencing civil war for the past number of years, yet the soldiers on the front lines can hear our Amharic language program. One of them wrote, I am a soldier, a member of the defense force, and I am in one of the front lines. As you know, the situation is very harsh because we are battling with our own brothers. What a pity to face such a challenge, he writes. Anyway, your radio program is my comforter, friend, church, and Bible school here in the wilderness. I learned what it means to be a Christian and what the Bible talks about. Jesus is our King, God, and Savior. I will keep learning about his kingdom and will follow your advice too. Please pray for me for my friends, and for all Ethiopian people who are suffering from the conflict in the area. It's the end of his letter. Jesus set an example of what it means to go to people across the ideological, cultural, or physical divide. Let's follow him here in Mark chapter 5 as Bible teacher J. Mark Horst looks at this scripture with us. What was the purpose for Jesus coming to earth 
I'll give you a hint. There's more than one right answer to that question. But in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 8, John answers this question very clearly. In the context, John is writing about the relationship between sin and the child of God. And this is what he wrote. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Now listen. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So the Son of God was revealed so that he might destroy the works of Satan. It seems that John is simply reminding us of what God promised to Eve in Genesis 3.15. There we read, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Some versions read that the seed of the woman, Jesus, will crush the head of the serpent. In the Gospels, we see Jesus doing this very thing. Before he began his public ministry, he endured a time of temptation in the wilderness. And it was there, during those forty days, that Jesus convincingly demonstrated his power over Satan. And he did that specifically by using the written word of God. And then in Mark chapter 1, on the Sabbath and in the synagogue, Jesus delivers a man from a demonic spirit and shows his mastery over the powers of darkness. That brings us to our text for this study, Mark chapter 5 and verses 1 to 20. Matthew and Luke also record the details of this amazing event. In the biblical record, not since God cast Satan and his angels out of heaven, have so many demons been simultaneously displaced by one divine command. But before we get to our text, let's consider the larger context. What was happening just before the events of this chapter? Well, in Mark chapter 4, Jesus was teaching his disciples about the characteristics of the kingdom of God. He compared it to the mystery of a growing plant. The farmer plants the seed, but he can't make it grow. Neither can he fully explain how it grows. And furthermore, he implied that the kingdom would start as a very small seed, and yet it would grow into a large tree so birds could come and nest within its shade. And then at the very end of chapter 4, we have the account of Jesus sleeping during a wild storm on the Sea of Galilee. You might recall he was exhausted from a couple of days of nonstop ministry. They had been so busy they didn't even have time to eat. So immediately after they leave the crowds behind, Jesus falls asleep in the back of the boat. And when the violent storm erupts, he keeps right on sleeping. The disciples are struggling to control the ship, and their fear is growing by the minute. They're facing the reality that this voyage isn't going to end well. So they awaken Jesus with a cry of despair. Don't you care that we are perishing? And then Jesus miraculously stills the wind and the waves. After that, the disciples are even more terrified. Who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey him? It's interesting to me that question is left hanging, as it were, in the air. In their understanding, only God, the creator of earth and sea, can control such things. And that brings us to our text for today, Mark chapter 5 and verses 1 to 20. Listen to Mark's record of these amazing events. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could any one tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, 
My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine, that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about two thousand, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what it was that had happened. Then they came to Jesus, and they saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion, sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon-possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart out of their region. And when he got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him, and all marveled. If the disciples were out of their comfort zone during the storm, and with Jesus' response to the storm, the narrative that we just read must have compounded their uneasiness. The unpredictability of nature is one thing. The darkness of the demonic world, that's quite another. I've titled my teaching, Going to the dark side. This incident, recorded for us in Scripture, shows us the steps we must be willing to take in going to the dark side. The first step in doing that is crossing barriers. Jesus' teaching about the kingdom of God implied that it wouldn't be restricted to the Jewish people. That was consistent with the Old Testament teaching that God's concern was for all peoples and all nations. But those who lived in Jesus' day were convinced that salvation was of the Jews. They were God's chosen people. And that was and is true. And yet here is Jesus purposely crossing the Sea of Galilee to Gadara, a place that's largely inhabited by non-Jews. Do you think the disciples would have set out on this journey if they knew what would happen? Gadara was one of the cities of the Decapolis. This area on the eastern shore of the lake was populated by pagans, and it was a place the Jews avoided because they didn't want to become unclean. It was what we might call an other side of the tracks kind of place. The Greek inhabitants of this area were never on good terms with the Jews, and this herd of pigs that we read about might be their contempt for what they saw as Jewish prejudice. But Jesus had intentionally set sail with his disciples for this place. The text says that after the storm was stilled, they went to the other side of the lake. Was it still nighttime when they arrived? If so, that would add to the eerie surroundings of these events and the theme of darkness. Was the storm a metaphor for the chaos that existed in the life of the demon-possessed man? Was the storm an attempt by Satan? to dissuade Jesus from his ministry there in Gadara? I don't have a definite answer to those questions, but I think they're worth considering. And I also see some similarities with Jonah's experience. He was sent to preach deliverance to a group of people whom he despised. Satan didn't want the Ninevites to experience the love and mercy of God, and neither did Jonah for that matter. So he chose to disobey God. And when we disobey God, that's listening to Satan. And he ran the other way. In his case, God sent the storm to convince his reluctant prophet that obedience was the best path to follow. Now, what is it that causes barriers between people in the first place? Isn't it often fear? We fear the things we don't understand. So if people are different in their religion or their culture or the way they live, we tend to avoid contact with them. We may know they're in spiritual darkness and they need to hear about Jesus, 
but we're afraid that they might misunderstand our motives, and maybe they'll react negatively to us. What's on the other side of your Sea of Galilee? Are there areas in your community that you consider the dark side? Are there people you avoid so you don't become contaminated by sin? Is Satan putting roadblocks in your way to keep you from reaching out to people who make you uncomfortable? These questions are all valid, and they deserve a fair consideration. So Jesus took the first step in going to the dark side. He crossed to the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, a place largely inhabited by people who were living in spiritual darkness. Another step in going to the dark side is confronting evil. Some of the resource material I read as I prepared this teaching suggested that Jesus was the only one who got out of the boat when it landed on the shore of Gadara. Now that's possible, but given the length of time it takes for these scenes to unfold, I'm not so sure about that. However, it would fit with the disciples' concern about being contaminated by association with pagans. I mentioned in my previous teaching from the end of Mark chapter 4 that the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee was less populous than the west side. After several days of intense ministry, I'm sure the disciples and Jesus were looking forward to some respite from the crowds. But I also mentioned that Jesus had a divine appointment at the end of this voyage. So the rest they were longing for? It wasn't going to happen. As Jesus steps out of the boat onto the shore, he is immediately met by a raging lunatic, a man possessed with demons. We can only imagine how frightening his appearance must have been. He didn't live in a house like a normal person. Instead, we read that he lived in the tombs. Close to the place where Jesus and the disciples had come ashore, there were tombs carved into the rocky hillside. This was the normal practice for the burial of the dead at that time. But it wasn't normal for people to live in those tombs. They were considered unclean, and so people usually avoided them. That assured that this man was, for the most part, left alone, but not totally left alone. He must have been a terror to the community because the residents, according to verse 4, had often bound him hand and foot with shackles and chains. But he pulled the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. Perhaps there were even broken fragments of those previous attempts to bind him lying on the ground as this scene is unfolding. No one was strong enough to successfully restrain him, and they certainly couldn't tame him. I'm sure this man was somewhat of a legend, known far and wide across the Decapolis, and people stayed out of his way just as much as they could. Not only did he live in the tombs, but he also practiced self-mutilation. Night and day he roamed the mountains and the tombs, shrieking hideously and gashing himself with sharp stones. I imagine his body covered with oozing wounds and also with many scars from previous bouts of demonic frenzy. You know, biblically, these kinds of behaviors are always associated with idol worship and the demonic world. Even today, in Shia Islam, there is a holiday of Ashura, where devotees flagellate themselves in demonic frenzy until the blood flows freely. And you remember that's what the prophets of Baal did on Mount Carmel as well. The widespread practices of tattooing and piercing, cutting, sadomasochism, transgenderism, and more in our day are all evidences of the power of darkness. They strike at the heart of what and who God created us to be. The goal of demon possession is to distort and to destroy the image of God in mankind. And it causes me sadness and a great disappointment to see professing Christ followers practice tattooing and piercing and mutilation of their bodies. These things should have no place among the people of God. Now, if they were done before a person's new birth in Christ, that's a different story. In fact, I've met people who, after they were converted, regretted that they practiced some of those things. They wish they hadn't done it. To you, I say, if you're engaged in this kind of behavior, Jesus died for your sins. He died for your forgiveness and deliverance. 
and you are not beyond the reach of his grace. He wants to redeem and save and restore you. So when Jesus stepped out of the boat, this demoniac saw him from a distance, and he came racing toward him. How would you have felt in that situation? I can imagine that this naked, yelling maniac must have tested the newly recovered confidence of Jesus' disciples. As I said earlier, one step in going to the dark side is confronting evil, and that isn't going to be easy, and most likely it won't be pleasant either. So was this man going to attack Jesus? What was he going to do? Imagine their surprise when he falls prostrate right in front of Jesus. And even as he falls at Jesus' feet, he's crying out in terror. What do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you will not torture me. I think what we have here is a graphic example of what James tells us in his letter when he wrote, You believe that there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Demons get the shakes. They get uncontrolled shivers when they come into the presence of Jesus and they recognize that they are powerless before him. Now, why was this man crying out like this? Well, verse 8 tells us it was because Jesus had been repeatedly commanding the demons to come out of him. So the two actions were occurring simultaneously. Jesus' repeated commands for exorcism were frightening these demons and causing their frenzied reactions. It was a scene the disciples wouldn't soon forget. And then Jesus addressed him. He said, What is your name? His reply was, Legion, because he was possessed by many demons. At the time, a Roman legion was comprised of up to 6,000 soldiers. Now, I don't necessarily think that that means that this man had 6,000 demons, but it meant that there were many of them that were possessing him. Perhaps we can safely assume at least 2,000, because that's how many pigs died in the result of this exchange. As you think about the Roman legions, their goal was to enforce the will of the emperor. His word was law, and you disobeyed him at the risk of your own life. The goal of these evil spirits was to carry out the devil's will of bringing pain, destruction, and chaos into the life of this man. For them to fail in their mission and be sent prematurely to the abyss would incur Satan's wrath against them. Now, even though demons are spirit beings, it seems they're uncomfortable with being disembodied. Why else would they ask Jesus for permission to go into the pigs? Their horror at being sent to the abyss prematurely caused their frenzied request. Perhaps they thought they could temporarily inhabit the pigs until Jesus left, and then they could go and find new hosts in this pagan community. You know, Jesus warned us about this possibility in Luke chapter 11 and verses 24 to 26. He said, When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. This request also tells me that Satan and his demons are not omniscient. That is, they don't know everything. Would they have kept begging Jesus to send them into the pigs if they had known that those pigs would all drown in the sea? I don't think so, because they ended up without a body to host them. Now there's more to this teaching, but we're almost out of time for today, and so we're going to interrupt it here, and Anthony High will close the program for us. Thank you, J. Mark. We'll look forward to continuing this study the next time. We can see Jesus' power over the wind, the sea, and demons. And later in chapter 5, he goes into his power over disease and death. May his name be praised. Thank you again for joining us today on The Voice of Hope. If you would like to listen to this program again, please visit our website 
It's www.heraldsofhope.org. And look for the title, Going to the Dark Side. Or you may contact us to get a CD, paper, or digital copy. We would love to hear from you. If you would like to send a gift or a note, you may do so through our website, which is heraldsofhope.org, or contact us by email at hope at heraldsofhope.org. That's H-O-P-E at heraldsofhope.org. Our phone number is 866-960-0292. If you prefer to send a letter or gift by postal service, our mailing address is The Voice of Hope, P.O. Box 3, Breezewood, Pennsylvania, 15533. We also have a call-in number where you can listen to the three latest programs right from your phone. The phone number for our call-in program is 717-790-5503. Again, 717-790-5503. I invite you to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, or Spotify by searching for Heralds of Hope. Your prayers are needful, and your financial gifts are always welcome. You can learn more about Heralds of Hope and how we can be your channel to share the Word of God to a place you cannot visit and in a language you do not speak by visiting our website, www.heraldsofhope.org. God's grace, accompanied by your fervent prayers and generous financial support, will enable the Voice of Hope to be on the air until Jesus comes in the air. Be sure to join us the next time as we continue our study in Mark's Gospel. Greater is he that is in me, greater is he that is in me, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world, in the world. Satan's like a roaring lion roaming to and fro seeking whom he may devour the bible it tells me so many souls have been his prey to fall in some dark hour but god has promised us today his overcoming Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. In the world. Greater is he that is in me that is in me greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world